the broadcast ministry of Christ Way Fellowship brings you victory for today. Exalting the Savior, evangelizing the seeker, and equipping the saint. Committed to the principle that you can have victory today and every day through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And now, here's your host, Pastor Wayne Duncan. Now, I want to get started with our Bible study. We've been talking recently about our country's situation, the state of the nation, if you want to put it that way. We talked about one nation under God. And then last week, as we were going off from our study, I, I made the the reference to the fact that I believe, as I study the Word of God, I believe that what I see is that the key to turning things around in our country, the key to turning it around is the church. I'm talking about the true church. There are a lot of things that are called church nowadays that are not, not church. I'm talking about true born again believers, those that have turned their lives around, seen their lives turned around by the Lord Jesus Christ, have been born again, have their names written in the Lamb's book of life, and are living for Christ. And I think that we are the key to it. I think that we are the key to turning our nation around. Now today, I want to go on a little bit further in that, and I want us to think about this subject. For such a time as this, and I keep thumbing through this Bible, and I'm going to go over here to Matthew, if you want to follow along, Matthew chapter 5 and verse th uh, 13. 5.13, Matthew 5.13. But I want to just kind of reference a scripture in the Old Testament. This is in the book of Esther that I want to refer to. And you know that story, I hope, about Esther. She's become the queen there in Babylon, and she is in a position now of influence. And there's a decree that's about to be executed that's going to call for the death of all the Jews that are in Babylon. And her uncle goes to her, Mordecai goes to her, and he says, Look, uh, you, you, you're in a place of influence now, and who knows, it says, or who knows but that you are, have come unto the kingdom for just such a time as this. Now, dear people, church, I'm talking to church, really. Church, who knows but that we are coming to the kingdom for just such a time as this. Just such a time as this. Now, have you ever just sort of played with the idea of living in another time? Say, uh, well, you might want to, you know, if you like Westerns, you say, well, I wish I'd lived back in those Western days, <laughs> back there in the cowboy days, or maybe back in colonial times, or maybe back during the times of the Roman Empire, or whatever uh, period of history may interest you. But, but here's the clear truth is that if that's where God had wanted you and me to be born, that's where we would have been born. But he has had us be born and live in just such a time as this. I know sometimes we say, boy, I wish America was like it was back when I was growing up. Now, I'm, I'm kind of an old, old geezer now, and I grew up in the 40s and 50s and and uh, sometimes you think, well, boy, it was sure a lot different when I was growing up. Well, that's all well and good. But hey, you know what? We're not there anymore. We are here now, just such a time as this. Now, what I want to read to you, this is from the portion of Scripture that's called the Sermon on the Mount. This is a, a tremendous, tremendous study. But I just want to pick out one thing that Jesus said here to the multitude and to us. He says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Matthew 5 13. Now that's what I want us to concentrate on today. So let me just set this over here and I want to go to a little outline that I've made up here. You've probably uh, seen the, uh, the bumper sticker that says, America, love it or leave it. 
But dear Christian friend, you know what our bumper sticker for us ought to say is, America, love it and lead it. And as I've, I'm, I'm going on and on about this, but I want to make it, make it clear that the church, the born-again believers in this country and every other country in this world, we are the keys. We are the keys. Jesus said, you are the salt. And, and, and what our role is to be is that of the salt. Now, how do citizens in, in any country behave? Well, if there's freedom of speech at all, there's, there's a group that uh, they're critical, but they're not really loyal. In other words, they're critical of their government, they're critical of their country, and they're not loyal to their government or to uh, their country. They're just critics. And many times you find revolutionaries in this and radicals in this group of people. They're just critical. They're not committed to uh, the form of government in that country. Maybe it's a repressive regime and needs to be replaced. But I'm talking primarily about our situation here in the United States. And you find people like that. They're critical and they're not committed to the government that stands or to the nation. And then you find others that are not critical but are loyal. Now, when I was growing up, of course, during uh, World War II, I was just a small child. And then during the Korean War, I was older. And uh, I grew up during a time where there was a statement that was resurrected, I think, from way back before that. And it was this, our country, right or wrong. Now, I said that in a group of people the other day, and the, they, they responded with the end of it because they knew exactly they'd grown up in that same time. And so is that a good statement? In other words, you're loyal and you're not critical. You're not discerning about what's going on in your country. Well, folks, that, that is absurd. That's absurd to be non-critical and to be totally loyal. That's what leads to fanaticism. That's what was going on in the days of of Hitler's Germany, that people were, if they were critical, they were paying a price for it. But they were just blindly following after what their country, our country, right or wrong. And then there are those that can be neither critical nor loyal. I mean, these are the people that are just kind of coasting, coasting through their lives. I saw something the other day about the fact that we have troops in the field. And the statement was kind of like this. It said, uh, the American military is at war, but America is at the mall. Now, let me just translate that for a minute. I mean, in, in other words, there are those that are laying their lives on the line uh, for the principles of our country. And then there are others that are just living their lives out, just like I said here, neither critical nor loyal. They're just really not involved. They just want what's in it for me and just blithely going through life. I see that a lot with people that they just seem like they don't want to think about what's going on in Washington or in our state down at the Capitol, Baton Rouge. They just don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. They just want to be left alone and uh, just uh, go through their lives consuming and enjoying life and having what they have and so on and so forth. Well, now there's a fourth one. And that's a group of people that are both critical. And when I say critical, I mean discerning. Those that are discerning and loyal. They're loyal. They love the country. They love the principles that the country was founded on. And they're discerning in the fact that they're pointing out where we're getting off track. Now, may I just say to you that in my understanding, that's where the Christian citizen ought to be. America, love it and lead it. Be discerning. Uh, be critical when there are things that need to be criticized. And be loyal and stand for the country. Don't, don't stand for tearing it down. Uh, stand for the country. Stand for the government but not without being discerning about what's going on. So that's, that's four different types of citizens that you, that you come across or that you're around all the time. The fourth one is the one that I think the Christian ought to be a part of. Now let me just give uh, some guidelines here for responsible Christian 
citizenship and leadership. Now remember, and I mean this sincerely, this is not a program that's turning over into a political program. That's not what we're about. We're about exalting the Savior, uh, encouraging the saint, and evangelizing the seeker. That's what this program's about. And we're about studying the Word of God. But for this little period of time, I'm, I'm kind of getting off on, on this thing because I think it's so important and we need to, to really focus on this for a while. So we're talking right now about living in just such a time as this. Now, Christian citizenship and leadership. Number one, Christians need to... <laughs> Boy, this is going to sound like heresy. <laughs> Christians need to mix their religion and politics. You say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Separation. <laughs> Separation of church and state. <laughs> hey, look, friends, uh, that is not a part of our founding documents or any legal document in our nation. That's from a letter that was written by Thomas Jefferson to a friend and just lifted out and is used by those that want to silence those of us who have commitment and conviction based on uh, biblical and sound and Judeo-Christian ethics. That's what that's all about. That's just to shut you and me up, the separation of church and state. Now, nobody wants to see a church state. No one wants to see a state church. <laughs> no one wants to see that. No one, no one wants to see one particular church that is the, the, the church, the state's church or the, uh, the church of the state. That's, that's the church. You've got to belong to that church. There's been times throughout history that that has taken place. That's, if you go back and study any English history at all and start going through the days of the Tudors and you see how, you know, uh, Henry VIII broke away from the Church of Rome, established the Church of England, and then, you know, his daughter comes to power, and then another daughter, and it just flipped back and forth in one church state, and the other persecuted uh, whichever one was not in power. We, nobody wants that. We don't want that in America. We don't want the, the, the Baptists or the Pentecostals or the Methodists to be in charge of religion in America. We don't want that. We want freedom of religion, which is one of our founding principles, the freedom to worship God as we see fit. But having said all of that, let me, let me just go ahead and get back to our original statement that, that we must mix our religion with politics. In other words, here's what I'm saying. Our religious principles are what form our attitudes, our behavior, uh, it's what makes us uh, make decisions about what's right and what's wrong. You can't do away with that. And, and let's, like I said, I think it's used only by those that want to silence uh, those of us who have morals based on Judeo-Christian ethics. They just want to shut us up. So that's what that's about. We need to realize that our Christian convictions need to be interpreted in the way that we go about our politics. Don't leave your religion at home when you get involved with politics. Some people have done that, tried to do that. It never ends well. And so we need to realize that, that we need to mix our religion and our politics. Let's, let's make that a rule that we're going to set down or a, a guideline right there. Uh, number two, Christians need to be clear on the real issues confronting us. The real issues confronting us. And dear people, may I just uh, say to you that many of the things that we think are the issues are not the issues. Uh, we've got things going on right now that there's a smoke screen of an issue like climate, uh, you know, about our climate things, about how to be green and all this sort of thing. But and that and about the need that certain people have, that a percentage of our people have for health care and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that are just being used as a, as a front issue that, that's really a guise just for the grab of more tax money and more control and more intrusion into the freedoms that we have. 
So listen, my dear Christian friend, be informed. Uh, there's there's uh, today, with the advent of the internet and all that's are available like that, uh, there's no excuse if you're, at the, <laughs> if you're the least bit computer savvy, if you're the least bit into computers, there's no reason, uh, there's no excuse for you being uh, uninformed about issues. I mean, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of things both sides, no sides, just all kinds of, of uh, ways that you can find out about what the issues are, the true issues. So, so do that. Be informed, Christian. A lot, of, a lot of Christians now, they say, well, Jesus is coming back. This is all part of the end time scenario. And so I'm just going to drop periscope and wait for Jesus to come back. Well, honey, listen, <laughs> I, I believe Jesus is coming back. I believe that the uh, rapture is very near. I believe he's going to come and catch away his church. I, I believe all of that. But I also believe this, that it is still right to fight wrong. And we need to be in the business of fighting wrong right up until the moment that Jesus calls us out of this world. We are the salt of the earth. I'm going to get into that in more detail either later in this broadcast or next week. But we're just kind of laying some groundwork right now. So we need to be informed about the true, the real issues and not just take what the, uh, what the, the lame, <laughs> what do they call that, the uh, mainline uh, media, the lame mind media, <laughs> you might say. What, what they're telling you on ABC, CBS, and NBC, don't just take that as the gospel. But go and do some research. Spend a little time finding out what the real issues are and what's behind those issues and, and what's the motive behind bringing those issues up. Our country is changing rapidly, rapidly. And I don't know that uh, we really expected the changes that we have going on. That's not what most of us expected in the way of change. Instead of uh, change for the better, may I just uh, make this observation that most of the change is not for the better. It's for the worst. So we need to mix religion and politics. We need to mix our religious beliefs with what we support in politics. We need to be clear on the real issues that confront us. Christians need to be politically active and not naive in our involvement. We need to be politically active. I, uh, I just want to encourage everyone. Register. Vote. Let your vote count. But don't be naive. Don't, don't be a single issue voter. Think about the whole spectrum of what's going on. Don't vote for somebody just because they make a good speech or they look good on TV. See what they really stand for. I'm not talking about any political party here. I mean, Democrats, Republicans, they both got their strong candidates. They both got their, their people you really need to keep an eye on because they're up to no good. So I'm not, I'm not endorsing any candidate by saying these things. I'm not endorsing any political party. I'm just saying, dear Christian friend, get involved in politics. But don't be naive. Don't support somebody just because they support one little skinny issue that you're in favor of. But see what, they, what they're about on many issues and vote wisely. Christians need to work with and for right groups and individuals. Now, I think, just to be frank with you, and this is my opinion, I think that a lot of Christians have been, have been just taken for granted and taken in by certain political groups. They just think, well, they're going to, they've got to vote our way, and they, they dangle some little issue in front of our faces, and we just go hard charge and ride into their ranks and support them and, and donate our money and donate our time. Folks, listen, we need to be more careful than that. We need to be sure that we're involved with the right groups and the right individuals. Number five, some Christians need to run for public office. Yeah, some of you out there, some of you need to get serious about running for office. We need Christians in places of power in our country. 
And all Christians, we've talked about this before, need to vote intelligent, to be, intelligently. To be true Christians, one must realize and recognize that we serve a higher power. You see, for the Christian, we should be kingdom first, country second people. Do you know what I'm saying there? The kingdom of God is first in our hearts and lives. And even though we are politically active and we're a patriotic people, we need to realize that God and His kingdom comes first before country and before politics. You know, uh, it came to a place where Peter and John had to say to the, to the Sanhedrin, we must follow God rather than man. Well, I'm going to just stop here for right now. Let's just let this rest until next week and we'll get back to it because I've got some things.